Hi guys, welcome back. This is Mass Chat episode 215, featuring a retrospective uh, that's been long overdue, namely a little computer role-playing game classic called Albion. This is a game that was recommended to me by a couple of you guys on the forums, namely Adel Wolf and GoTrek44, and I'm really glad I took the time to check it out and offer you this retrospective. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Albion. And here we go with a little game called Albion. Wonderful, wonderful game for the uh, MS-DOS platform. Came out in 1996 in the U.S., or at least in the English translation. But it was out in 1995 in the original German. Developed by Blue Byte Software, a company that you should be familiar with if you watch this show. Because they are the ones that did one of my favorite games for the Amiga, The Settlers. Now this game here was primarily designed by refugees from a company called Thalion Software, another German developer, and they're the ones who did Amber Star and Amber Moon, some of the most popular Amiga role-playing games. And uh, this game here, Albion, originally uh, was being developed on the Amiga platform, an Amiga 1200 to be precise, but I guess somebody figured out that if they did that, they wouldn't make any money. Uh, Amiga, sadly pretty much dead at this point. So sadly got uh, developed for DOS instead. One of the programmers, uh, Jury Hornman, who also did the uh, programming on the uh, those other games I was talking about, he's got a lot of uh, blog posts up about this game. I'm going to try to get him on the show, hopefully. Uh, but according to him, they call it Albion simply because they wanted something that started with the letter A, something short enough to fit in a file name. And also they were really big into Celtic history and Celtic mythology, so <laughs> uh, we can look at that. He also talked about how he thinks that this game uh, may have been ripped off by James Cameron's uh, Avatar movie. Now, I'm not really familiar with Avatar, I've only seen it once, so if you are, I'd be kind of uh, interested to see what you think, if you see a lot of uh, comparisons here. But anyway, this opening sequence has to be, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say this is the weirdest intro movie to a computer role-playing game I've ever seen. I mean, this is like something you'd expect from uh, you know, William Burroughs or a Timothy Leary. I don't know what they were putting in the ale over there in a Blue Bite, but this is pretty weird stuff. See, there's that spinning ship. I guess they spin it to simulate gravity. Pretty cool. Really advanced graphics for the time, too. Really nice, well-executed cutscene here. A nice dramatic build-up. I don't know what you would expect to see what the game would look like after that intro, but I guess we'll see you in a moment. Well, for better or worse, the rest of the game doesn't look like that <laughs> dream sequence. So. Now, the manual says that they did this interface with the idea that you wouldn't need the manual at all. So I don't know if it's quite that intuitive. You probably should look at the manual. There's a few things you should probably know about the game uh, to really play it properly. A lot of this stuff is pretty standard fare for a role-playing game. Of course, you got the stats, strength, intelligence. Uh, dexterity affects your dodging, and uh, speed controls how far you can move in combat and how well you can flee. Uh, Close-range combat is melee, long-range combat, ranged attacks. Uh, critical hits apparently influence both. Uh, you can set up how you want your people to uh, be set up at the beginning of a combat. Uh, usually, you know, you put your melee in front, and your weak guys as far back as you can. Uh, you move around with the mouse. You pretty much control everything with the mouse. You don't ever have to touch the keyboard. Quite nice. I, I like that. Uh, just looking in some of the chests. Tried to upgrade his equipment. Uh, you do have to eat in this game, and it's not... You know, I went, the first couple times I played this, I didn't even realize that they put the, the rations and the gold and the loot screen at the bottom. It's not necessarily obvious, so really pay attention to that. Ah, here we go. Here's uh, our character there. His name is Tom, and Christine is his girlfriend. And quite a nice uh, girlfriend. Uh, what they're talking about here is this uh, this science fiction world or concept of light speed in this game is uh, you can't go faster than the speed of light unless you get far away from a source of gravity. So you have to be a long ways from a planet. So it's still very expensive and it's very, um, sort of historically, they're just getting into going to other planets and trying to find resources to harvest. So they found this mysterious place called the Nugget. 
and that's what this game is all about. So I guess now that I'm thinking about it, there is uh, going to be quite a bit of uh, similarities to Avatar. Uh, quite a bit of dialogue, too. Um, I saw somewhere where they said that there was uh, 150,000 words in the story. So I like the fact that it's not uh, voice acted, so you can rapidly... I don't know about you, I read a lot faster than I. It takes the voice actor's time to read it, so it speeds it up a lot when you can just speed read. A lot of uh, nice detail here. You can just about examine everything. Unfortunately, it's not always clear at all what you can actually interact with. So you just have to go up to it, right-click on it, and if you can interact with it, it'll have the verb manipulate there. I guess they, I don't know why they call it manipulate instead of use. <laughs> it's part of that extensive vocabulary uh, these Germans have. They, they, you know, they really did a great job with the translation, by the way, too. I didn't see any, uh, you know, bad grammar, misspelled words, you know, nothing like that. It's, it's very solid, very well done uh, script and translation. Something else you really notice about this game, too, is almost every level is huge. <laughs> you know, and you kind of you zoomed in uh, pretty close, as you can see. So it takes quite a while to get around these levels. and uh, At least at first, you don't have a compass in some of the... You have an auto mapper later on that would be really nice. But at least in cases like this ship, it can be pretty confusing. You just have to kind of remember where you're going. Some really funny news... If you uh, check these news readers here, a lot of stuff about Germany and Britain. Uh, there was, uh, you know, the Gates Prize for physics. Lots of uh, fun stuff there. Uh, the really fun one, I wasn't able to get up. I don't know if I just, uh, it was random or what, but there was one about the the Vatican having biological weapons. Uh, and they had developed some kind of brainwashing techniques. That's <laughs> uh, pretty funny. But uh, I couldn't seem to get that one to pull up, pull back up again, but. Anyway, lots of it's definitely worth uh, reading the text because there's a lot of funny little inside jokes and references and things. So the conversation engine, you can either type in words, keywords, or they uh, just talk to them, ask them questions, and sometimes you'll get the keywords that way. And I guess you can ask them about objects too, but uh, that only seems to work in a few situations. There's definitely a lot of adventure game elements to this. And definitely more dialogue than you might be accustomed to in a role-playing game. See, the more you talk to him, the more keywords you get. Uh, the reason I'm talking to her mainly is just to get the free chocolate ration. Because uh, the first couple times I played this, I ran out of food. So I definitely want to make sure I get all the food I can carry this time. You're starting to get a feel for just how big this ship is. I mean, this is just the opening of the game, and they already throw you in a pretty large world. You don't necessarily run the fastest either, so <laughs> definitely takes some time. Okay, manipulating the chest, and I get some lock picks. These are very useful. Another problem with the game, well, I mean, not a problem with the game, but just one of the difficulties is you don't have a lot of money. So you really have to be careful how you marshal those resources. Those lock picks, for example, if you have to buy them, it's uh, quite expensive, and you need the money for food, among other things. Ah, Rainier, Rainier. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this guy's name, but this will be my companion. Let's see there more about the those British blockheads. I'm kind of curious now what the you know you guys from from Germany that uh, watch the show. You know, I wonder how much of this is just kind of flying over my head because I'm not German. You know, is this sort of widespread uh, anti-British <laughs> uh, attitudes there or something? Or, I, I don't know. But I definitely noticed some of that in the game. Okay, here we go. Now, these guys, there is something that has happened in the communications room. Uh, I don't know. These guards aren't being very forthcoming. And you start to get the feeling that there's something weird going on the ship. There's been this accident. Some of the there's only one uh, government person left alive on the ship. Uh, something there's some kind of conspiracy afoot. Of course, uh, you won't find out what you know the details of that for quite a while. But not so as it appears to be. Here's good old Joe Bernard. Good old Joe. 
He likes to slack off, and he also likes to give uh, his friends the secret codes. 1042. He's going to have some fun with this here in a minute. Now, the cool thing about this game engine is you got this, I guess, three different perspectives. You have this top-down perspective that, you know, I'm using right now to get around the buildings and the ships and so on. Uh, then we'll, in a minute, you'll see the first-person 3D perspective for the dungeons. And then there's a more distance or top-down view for overland travel. So, you know, uh, Jury, the, apparently the interface programmer, <laughs> this is a real tour de force for him. Seeing if I can find some more news. I guess this one doesn't work. You know, it would have been nice if you could have pressed a button and got the, the hot spots highlighted or if they'd have made the, the stuff you can interact with look a little bit different. And this is, uh, <laughs> okay, this is just bad. <laughs> you can't just type in the number. You have to actually do it that way. Now, check this out. Look at that. I mean, that is just smooth, awesome, <laughs> Doom quality. Heck, it's even beyond uh, Doom quality. Kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, Ultima Underworld interface. Great little auto map you can pull up. I don't have the compass yet, but eventually you'll have a compass and a clock. Make it a lot easier to get around. But now, The whole thing, like I said, you control it with the mouse. You can also do the keyboard thing, but I like this better. You know, you can have a beer in your left hand and just control the whole thing with the, your right hand. Multitasking. Okay, the old floor plate, pressure plate puzzle. There's some uh, pretty interesting puzzles in the game. Uh, some of them I, you know, I wasn't able to figure out. I guess you could always look at a walkthrough, but uh, <laughs> it's kind of lame. All right, just looking around. If you move the mouse up in the corners, you get that turn option. If you go to the left side or right side, it's just, you know, you can strafe, I guess. And you can also do an about face. Just a really nice uh, way to do things. And the more extreme that you push it, the faster he goes. So it takes a little bit of getting used to, but once you get this figured out, it, it just seems like a really nice way to get around. I actually wouldn't mind seeing this interface in more modern games. The only thing is, uh, you know, until you get that compass, <laughs> it can get really... You really have to check the map a lot to make sure you're going in the right place. I really, really wish there was a way to get a little mini map up on the screen. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a pain to have to right click and go to map and you know, do this again and again. And of course, if you haven't figured it out, uh, these robots take a little path through and the doors open up for them. So you just have to make sure that you go through with the robots. There's some little panels we have to interact with. So if you recall, I'm trying to get into that communications room and check out what happened. And once I get in there, there'll be a nice little adventure game-like puzzle I have to figure out. It's really a shame they weren't actually able to release a version of this for the Amiga, maybe with the CD32. Really, really been cool. Okay, so I'm almost there. Now imagine if it's, if it's tricky getting around these box-like levels. <laughs> Holy cow. Wait till we get down on the planet and we start having these really confusing uh, plant maze-like levels. It can really get tricky. All right, so going through. I think that's the last door. Yeah, okay. Here's the wall cabinet. This is kind of cleverly laid out. So since there's an empty wall cabinet there, it doesn't really tell you what that might be for. There's nothing in it. So just keep that in mind, because there'll be a really cool puzzle involving that. All right, so just to skip forward a little bit here. Another one of these babies in the code, thankfully, is the same as last time. Quite convenient. <laughs> the security on this ship uh, leaves a lot to be desired. Okay, 1042, we are through. And there's the ladder up. So now I'm back to that. Isometric view. Pretty cool. Now let's see. So what happened here in the communication room? How did old Snoopy die? That's a metal can. As you'll see once we get down to the planet, metal is quite scarce. So we might be able to sell that. 
All right, so we have a weapon. So not only is there a mysterious explosion here, somebody left a pistol and some bullets behind. Highly unusual. There is something nefarious going on here. Have a little look around there. You can see the explosion. These stem drinks are worth their weight in gold, let me tell you. You take a lot of damage in combat, and it's really nice. You can take those potions at any time and heal up. Now, I could just go right through those doors where those security guards are, get a pat down, and lose my pistol. I've only done that once. <laughs> no, you don't want to do that. Remember that cabinet that we were at earlier? Now, let me show you what the cabinet is for. There's a lot of secrets in this game. It's, it's very detailed. Manipulate. Here we go. Watch this. So now if I can get back to the cabinet from the other side of the door. Oh, I just reached level 5. Got some new training points. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Now I can get my uh, the sleep of everything here. So this is kind of a one-way door, right? I got to go back through the guards and then come back around. But then I'll just be able to come back the way I came the first time and get my pistol. Hey, guys. <laughs> Whoa, how'd you get in there? <laughs> ah, Driscoll. Uh, get the old pat down. I'm going to get written up for that, but it's okay. I'll just go back around, and I'll spare you that footage, but you have to go all the way back around and get the pistol. I mean, while there, you're kind of late for your shuttlecraft. I mean, you are, after all, only the pilot. Can't they do it without you? Apparently not. But the flip side of that is they can't leave until you're good and ready. <laughs> you can really take your time, explore this ship from top to bottom, take every plate and every fork, every rag. You'll be able to sell most of that, but at least you can satisfy those klepto tendencies. All right, let's uh, skip a bit. Not exactly sure how long it would take you to get all the way through the game. I mean, it's absolutely massive in scope takes a good uh, at least an hour to get off the first little sequence especially if you really take your time and explore everything thoroughly all right there's the captain we're going to go down on this little shuttlecraft to make a observation some studies of this seemingly desert-like planet all right here we go the totally awesome shuttle sequence whoa you know actually though i i do really like this this art, the graphic style of this. It reminds me very much of the Amiga games. And, you know, if I didn't happen to know it was developed on an Amiga, I would definitely would have suspected as much. It definitely has that Amiga-like aesthetic to it. A little animation there of the planet. I'm sure all this stuff was really <laughs> cutting edge uh, back in 95. Still looks good today. Okay, let's see. So we... As uh, you probably suspected, the flight down to the planet will not be uneventful. Already the communications are breaking up. And as Star Trek has shown, doesn't matter how far into the future you go, apparently at some point in humanity's development, we totally forget how to make a fuse. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Whenever the circuits overload, it tends to send people flying. Okay, so we've crashed. Somehow, we're not dead. <laughs> uh, I guess we're on the surface there. That's why you can't see outside. Kind of a cool moment where they're not really sure if the air is breathable or not, but they know that they really have no other choice. You know, They might as well get out there and, <laughs> and check it out. And if, <laughs> if it's poisonous, uh, well, that's the end of the story. So that's the end of the game. No. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's breathable. And look, there's all kinds of bugs and critters and plants. You know, it doesn't look like a desert land at all. Unfortunately, the oxygen in the environment has caused the ship to explode. We're back to our acid trip. I was hoping we could see some more of this. Does this remind you of a certain year back in college? Okay, Chris... It's already happened, pain, almost getting a poetic. God, the crash. What happened? Oh, the pain. All right, guys, here it comes. <laughs> One, two, three, four. 
Yeah, these are definitely a highly evolved species. Where am I? Who? What is that? Quite a clear sign of recovery. So basically, you've been knocked coma. You've been in a coma basically for, I don't know, weeks. So totally oblivious to all these uh, four-breasted cat ladies walking everywhere. I guess, it, is it fair to call them cougars? Uh, anyway, uh, they do have four four breasts. I think I've probably mentioned that already. Um, and they have no problems at all with nudity. Pretty cool. I like these people. You know, these, you know if you're going to have to crash land somewhere on a strange alien planet, this is the kind of uh, planet I would like to wake up on. So our little scientist buddy here, he's actually been learning the language. Apparently learn you can learn this these this uh species language in only four weeks, and he can teach it to you in just a couple of days. <laughs> I guess these people have a real facility for learning languages. And there's a hell of a lot of text here. Oh my god, you can learn all about these creatures' culture. It's about as far away from a simplistic hack and slash game as you can get. Kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, sort of story-heavy RPGs, like Betrayal at Crondor, that sort of thing. You know, at least uh, half the fun of this game is going to be from the science fiction story elements. So if you're just going to, if you just want to hack and slash, you know, you definitely want to pass on this. But if you like a good story, lots of good dialogue, um, I'd recommend it. Okay, but I will skip ahead here because you probably should see some of the combat. All right. Just getting some essentials here. Looks like we have a shield. There's a, most of the items are worthless. You can't even sell them, so there's no point in lugging them around. You have to worry about weight limit, too. They're pretty strict about that. Later on, I'll have some extra party members, and I can spread out the food amongst the different party members. But uh, the gray-headed guy there, Rainier, he's quite weak. He can't carry very much, so it'll be a real pain in the ass. Trying to make sure you carry some loot. All right, so I'm in the basement of this uh, hunting clan's lodge, or whatever they call their little hall. And they told me that I can get, you know, since I donated the remains of our shuttle, remember how metal's very valuable, they basically given me free reign to go down to their cellar here and take whatever I want, look through the wreckage of the, of the ship and see if I could find anything useful. It's definitely worth doing this at the start of the game because you will find some very useful items. On the downside, though, the battles down here are going to be very tough. So it's probably a good thing if you get that pistol. It's going to come in very, very handy because at this stage of the game, you hardly have any equipment. You haven't leveled, so your characters are very weak. And it would really suck to get this far and then just die in combat. So Grab the pistol. You know, they're also pretty strict in this game about who can wear certain types of armor and what kind of weapons you can wield. There's these, uh, a lot of the stuff is made just for those cat people at the start of the game. I forget what they, Iskai, Iskay people. So you won't be able to equip their armor and shields and things, but later on, of course, you'll meet, you'll have some of those in your party, so it doesn't hurt to pick up a few items here and there for later on. Unfortunately, there are some items for the humans. You really want to get as good of armor as you can, because you definitely will be taking lots of damage. You can rest up after a battle, but you can only do that. Uh, you know, some kind of timer that controls when you can rest. And it's pretty significant, so really you should only expect to be able to rest maybe once. One time after you go into the dungeon. And uh, it actually heals you more or less, depending on how comfortable the place is that you're resting. So... Even though you can rest in a, in a dungeon, you won't get as good a healing that way as if you were in a city or back in the hunting lodge. So something to think about. All right, so empty barrels. Let's uh, skip forward a bit here, and I'll show you the really cool thing here in the basement. Unbelievable! There is a working clock. <laughs> this baby's going to really be valuable because uh, the shopkeepers in the city... There's probably some other events as well that run on a clock. And if you don't have that clock there, there's no way to know what time it is. So definitely handy, handy, handy thing to have. Now, the other thing that's essential is a compass. I'll show you that later on. You have to buy that. Anyway, I'll skip forward a little bit more so you can see the combat. 
Okay, so this is sort of a combination ambush slash <laughs> we're trapped. You can't go back out the way you came. So this is why this is so hard. Okay, so you can see there's a, this grid here. It doesn't really take into consideration the terrain. I can only move my people in those first three uh, rows. Just a right click and then give them the order. They'll keep repeating the order if it makes sense. See, I can't attack except with the ranged from a distance, of course. You notice that pistol is really just <laughs> knocking them out with one shot. Oh, man, let me tell you, that is uh, really nice. First time I played this, I didn't have the pistol, and those guys were just slaughtering me. So just take, taking a look here. There'll be some pretty nice treasure here in this this part, but I'll do do a lot more fighting. You definitely want to keep a couple of different saves, save games going because, like I said, this is not a hand-holding game. It's not going to offer you a juice box and change your diaper, <laughs> patch you down with some baby powder. No, sir! This is serious, hardcore. <laughs> yeah, just shoot them with a the pistol gameplay. Hope these guys aren't endangered species. Nope, they're not. <laughs> Hope I don't run out of bullets. You know, maybe I should. I don't know if I should save the bullets. Maybe there's tougher enemies later on, but I really don't care. Because, <laughs> like I said, this is sort of payback for my first playthrough. Ah, yeah. That's very satisfying. You know, this Rainier guy, he's weak, but the monsters always seem to go right for him every time. <laughs> Must be a little bit of AI going on there. So it's not quite as sophisticated of turn-based combat as you would get in something like a Pool of Radiance or whatever, but uh, it does get more complex later on once you get these extra party members and then you get magic spells you can cast, so it ratchets up in complexity. Still, though, I don't think combat is necessarily the, the game's strong suit. It's more about exploration and story. All right, so skipping forward again, we've gotten out of the basement. Got a nice reward for that. Lots of food. <laughs> I mean, a hell of a lot of food. A lot of gold, too. Definitely starting off better than I did last time. Okay, got the lock open. Now I'm in the city proper. Getting a dress there. And this guy dressed in battle armor. More text there. Now I can go straight to the, the sort of chief, chiefess. <laughs> chiefess, is that a, a word? But, you know, you probably want to explore the town a little bit first. Be plenty of time for that later. Now, what's cool about this overland map is once you go to a store or merchant once, then it remembers the location, and you can scroll over the map, and those little blinking dots there are the, you know, the stores, and you just click on this, the blinking dot, and it will just zap you right there. It saves a lot of time, you know, and it shows that the developers really knew, you know, how to ease the tedium of getting around a big big city like this you know i really appreciate those kinds of uh you know concessions to interface make the player's life a little easier because it's not necessarily the easiest place to get around okay so the battle trainer basically every time you level up you get so many of these training points and you can put those into either close combat or ranged combat and of course there's also new weapons you can outfit your troops with Unfortunately, this is the Yiskai City, so most of the stuff, as I said before, will be only for them. Now, here's a little trick I, I read about. <laughs> okay, so the thing with the stores are all the merchants have a limited inventory. It's actually very limited. They can only buy a certain amount of items. So uh, a little trick ar a way around that, there's a tr sort of traveling merchant here that hangs out in front of the store. You do have to... Click him right, but once you go through his his um, dialogue options, you can actually sell a lot of stuff to him. He's got basically an empty inventory. Now you don't want to sell cheap stuff to him because you know, like I said, once you sell something, that slot is gone. So you just probably just want to just throw away the really worthless items. If it's not worth more than two or three gold coins, I would, you know, probably suggest otherwise because it really sucks when you have a you know, an item worth 70 gold, and you have to buy back something you sold him earlier in order to sell it to him. I don't really know why they did it like, like that. 
it looks like they have a plenty of space over there in that merchant side. I guess I didn't want to make it too easy. It's part of the challenge. All right, let's get forward a bit more. So after you've cooled your heels in town for a few days, the drama starts to happen. So basically this kid here, he's a, about to have his coming-of-age ceremony. It's a big ritual. And uh, everything's going smoothly when a masked figure who <laughs> looks kind of like a human... Uh, shows up and does that. Okay. Sees the human. So these guys don't even realize that they're not the only humans on the planet. It's actually these uh, people called the Celts. Uh, they've <laughs> been here all along, and uh, naturally they're going to think, Link, you know, put two and two together. These two guys just happen to show up, and suddenly there's this assassination. So we're going to be under suspicion for a while and have to prove our, our innocence. Kind of a bit of convoluted uh, story arcs here, but uh, suffice it to say we'll have to clear our names and that's going to involve finding that assassin. Fortunately, the, though, the guy that they get to sort of escort and chaperone us and help us get to the bottom of this is Drear. He joins the party and he's <laughs> he really kicks a lot of ass. <laughs> You're going to love having this guy in the party. Plus, you finally have somebody you can equip all of that this guy armor and weaponry on, so. So eventually the trail of the assassin takes you here, this little guild hall, plant building, plant dungeon. And this place is very tricky to get around, and there is some freaky stuff here, like these plants that begin to glow <laughs> in rainbow colors. Uh, there's probably, they probably have something to do with a puzzle that I wasn't never figured out. You also have these strange penises everywhere. Again, I don't really know uh, what substances were imbibed in the making of this game. Anyway, let's come away from the... <laughs> They're everywhere! Okay. You also have that weird sound effect and those huge lightning bugs. Pretty freaky place. But anyway, let's go ahead and look at some of the later parts of the game. So after you've solved the murder mystery, you are ready to go sailing off to the land of the Celts. You're trying to find that where your ship landed, or the rendezvous point. This lovely little sailing animation. And while these different areas are fairly expansive, I mean, there's lots to explore, they are uh, basically self-contained. So you know, once you move from that first island to this island, won't be able to go back for a long time. So that kind of uh, reins it in a little bit, keeps it from becoming just overwhelming. Of course, you also have to consider, if you don't save, keep a couple different save games going, you might find yourself in over your head, <laughs> as uh, what happened to me here. Some of the guides I looked at suggested that you, you know, level up the characters up to about level 12 or so. I forget the exact number, but you could probably get through it. It would just take you longer. You have to reload more often. So this is the land of the Celts. This is probably one of the most bizarre aspects of the game. You know, you have all these aliens and spaceships and everything, and then these cat-like people, and then Celts? <laughs> what the hell? Uh, apparently the guy developers just really like Celtic mythology, and they sort of found a way to throw them in there. You're going to like stuff like that. keeps it from being the standard old cliche. You know, a lot of uh, original stuff here. Plus, these uh, Celts, it's quite a nice change from the the cat people. Now, these people are lots of fun. Get in there to the Celtic chief. <laughs> You're not going to believe the mission that he sends us on. <laughs> All right, so this little hut here belongs to the king of Clauta, Cluta, Cluata, however you pronounce that. And, of course, uh, he's not just going to send us right on to the, the ship. I'm going to have to do a... A little mission for him first. Good old Tharnos. Okay, so there's a lot of text to read there, but the basic idea is he needs the, uh, shall we say, a uh, masculine enhancement. Um, so we're going to go have to track down some <laughs> druids and get their druidic version of Viagra. 
<laughs> you can't make, you can't make this stuff up. Okay, so let's end there. I'll show you that last little dungeon I got too. So you'll notice I got a new party member too, a druid. So he's got the combat magic, and my this guy magic user there does the healing stuff. Okay, oh, didn't mean to go back up. So there's a bucket and some water. You know, put two and two together, you're probably going to need to uh, fill the bucket with the water. There's another bucket over there. So there's a lot of interesting puzzles in addition to the combat, which I always like. You know, these are fairly complicated. The one thing that's a bit tricky with this interface is uh, moving these guys very precisely to avoid the spikes in the fire. You know, I kept messing up and burning them anyway. I guess you probably should be a little bit more careful with the controls. Okay, there's the blades are down. So anyway, you know, you can see there's quite a bit of, uh, you know, this looks very different than that those plant levels, so it's always good to have some variety. It definitely keeps the game from becoming stale. You know, just about the time you get really sick of uh, the scenery, you move on to something very different, so that's quite nice. Need to go fill those buckets back up. But anyway, you get the idea. Uh, this is Albion. Unfortunately, I, you, you can't buy this from GOG or Steam. You can get it from Am Abandoned Wear Slides. Uh, Am how do you say it? Abandonia? Abandonia. <laughs> uh, that side has it, but uh, that's actually the best version I was able to find is actually on uh, the torrent sites. Uh, it's an Albion 1995 torrent. And it has the, basically all the CD uh, stuff set up with DOSBox. So just one click. You're playing the game it was as it was <laughs> meant to be played and uh, it also has the nice uh, PDF version of the manual included so that that's the version I'd recommend it is a shame though maybe uh, they'll eventually get this on to steam or gog because I know, I know people like to support the developers <laughs> it's kind of funny that I'm talking about abandoned where torrent sites right as I'm walking through fire anyway guys it's been fun and hope you enjoy playing Albion. <laughs> That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a, an interview. I'm not quite sure who it's going to be yet, but uh, I know you're going to enjoy it. Got a few uh, possibilities in the works that I'm really excited about, but I don't want to spoil. Um, also, I need to draw your attention to some Kickstarter projects that are out now that uh, you really, sh I think they're well worth your time and your money. Uh, the first is, uh, make sure I got the name right here, Abduction. Now this is from the Cyan team, the company that brought us the Mist and Riven games. And there's only a few days left to go on that, and they're just so close, it's just painful. So if you like Mist and Riven, uh, head on over there and donate to that. Uh, there's also uh, one called Deathfire Ruins of... <laughs> I actually didn't write down the last word. I think it's Evermore. Uh, anyway, Deathfire. And that is uh, from Guido Hinkle. He's uh, one of the developers that worked on Planescape Torment, Realms of Arcania. And it's got a ways to go. It's uh, fairly uh, new, but we really need some help getting the word out about this one. It's going to be wonderful. Turn-based combat. You get to create your a full party instead of just one guy. Uh, so really looking forward to that. So please uh, stop over there and chip into that. And then uh, finally, um, even more recently, there is a, uh, a Wings Kickstarter from CinemaWare. Uh, you probably played that game if you had Amiga back in the day, but anyway, they're trying to remake uh, the classic Wings uh, flight simulator slash, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, <laughs> it's CinemaWare. Uh, but anyway, that, that looks really good, so I thought I'd mention that too. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated to this show. really means a lot to me, guys. I've uh, finally got enough saved up now to uh, get the voiceovers or the liners for that podcast show I've been talking about. Uh, really exciting plans for that. hope you guys will stay tuned. If you would like to support the show, uh, just head over to mattchat.us. You can do a subscription or a one-time donation. If it's been a while since you donated, uh, consider uh, going back if you don't want to do the subscription option. But anyway, guys, I really, really appreciate your help. Now what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week I've got a little number called the Double Pastured. Uh, this is of course from the Stone uh, Brewing Company out of uh, 
Escondido, San Diego, and uh, Reese, you know, where I've been going to buy my L's lately. And when he saw me come in, he rushed this, rushed out and handed me this. Apparently this is only made once a year. It's a very big deal. It's 11.2% uh, alcohol, and uh, like all the stone beers, you got a huge write-up on the bottle. About it, some funny stuff there. Uh, apparently this is a uh, ale not to be wasted on the tentative or weak. Only the worthy are invited. <laughs> it goes on uh, for quite a lot, a long time. Apparently this is one lacerative mother of a beast, of a beer. Uh, looks like quite a, I mean, I'm sure all this text will be even funnier after you've drank the bottle. Uh, let's see if there's anything else on it. Uh, I don't really see anything else to read there. Uh, so anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this double bastard ale here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Uh, I've been smelling this. I got to tell you, this is definitely an ale that will clear these sinuses. Uh, smell a lot of sort of sweetness here, a lot of uh, kind of a molasses-like thing. Uh, it smells a little bit like raisins. Uh, I'm guessing this is going to be very sweet and uh, very bitter. Anyway, let's give it a taste. Uh, definitely very sweet, kind of a raisiny like flavor to it, like a very sharp uh, blackberry. Uh, the aftertaste quite bitter, <laughs> sharply bitter uh, aftertaste on this one. I guess it kind of balances it out. Um, interesting uh, combination of flavors here. There's a lot going on. Let me try it again. Yeah, very, it's nice and creamy, thick. Uh, very sweet going down, and then you get this sort of bitter um, aftertaste. A little bit of a cherry-like flavor at the end there. Uh, very complex ale. You, know, <laughs> uh, you definitely wouldn't want to chug this, which is probably what I'll do anyway. But anyway, uh, very strong, very uh, mas <laughs> masculine ale. <laughs> I think it actually lives up to the, all the hype on the bottle. I'm going to go a full 5 out of 5 drinking horns on this. I'm not usually a big fan of the, the bitter uh, stuff, but it really works in this case. It really balances out that really sweet uh, effect you get at first uh, with the bitterness at the end. It just sort of works really well. Uh, definitely five out of five, very solid choice here. So let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking for quotes uh, from James Cameron, and I found one that just seems appropriate. I have no idea what the context of this quote is, uh, but it really works uh, for this episode. And it goes something like this. I blame it on Walt Disney, where animals are given human qualities. People don't understand that a wild animal is not something that is nice to pat. It can seriously harm you. See you guys next week. This room is a pigsty. Thank you.